everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about the living world. I'm warning you now. Brain's a little sleepy today, so I'm moving kind of slow. Hopefully this will be all right, but you might as well grab a snack because this could be a longish video. So let me get you your objectives, and we'll go ahead and get going. There are actually four of them today. So by the end of this video, you should know or be able to do the following things. First of all, list resources that animals must obtain from their diet. Second thing, discuss the major stages of food processing. Third, provide examples of digestive system modifications that correlate with dietary needs. There's a lot of words in that one. And finally, explain mechanisms that regulate appetite. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get going. <clears throat> So the first question is, why eat in the first place? And the whole reason that we eat, other than the fact that food is delicious, is that we need to get essential nutrients. Now, our body is capable of synthesizing some things. We can build some amino acids. We can build some fatty acids. We do get some vitamins from bacteria. But there are a lot of things that we can't make inside of our body, so we have to get them from our diet. There are amino acids we can't synthesize, so we must take those in through our diet. Same for some fatty acids, same for vitamins, and certainly the same for minerals. We can't really synthesize any minerals in our body. So the whole reason that we eat, other than to get the calories that we need to stay alive from day to day, is that we need those essential nutrients also so that we can continue functioning as living organisms. Now... <clears throat> quick overview and then I'm going to go through the steps. All food processing in organisms that actually ingest food is as follows. There's ingestion, digestion, absorption, and elimination. Those are the four major steps um, that is going to apply from snakes all the way up through us and probably actually down below snakes too. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and for a human talk through each of these steps. So when you go to grandma's house and you eat a delicious dinner, the first thing you do is ingestion. And this is you know, the actual act of taking food into the mouth and chewing it up. And digestion also starts in the mouth. So in the mouth, you've got chemical digestion where there are some enzymes in your saliva that begin to break down simple carbohydrates. And then there's also mechanical digestion where you're actually chewing the food and preparing it to go into the rest of your digestive tract. So after you take in that delicious turkey, you chew it up. It forms a bolus, which is like a ball of chew, chewed food and saliva in the back of your throat. And then you swallow it and it travels down the esophagus. After its journey down the esophagus, it lands in the stomach, which I'm marking on the diagram. We have eaten, gone down the esophagus, behind the liver, and we are now in the stomach. Um, in the stomach, a couple of major things happen. Um, you, first, you get your big, like first big, I guess, digestive action, in that we've got some pretty, pretty acidic substances in our stomach that break down food really well. Um, in the stomach is where a lot of protein is digested and broken down. There is a chemical called pepsinogen that works on the bonds in your proteins. It starts unraveling them and breaking them apart. Also in the stomach, a substance called chyme is formed, and chyme is a mixture of digested food and the digestive juices. And then that mixture is going to be pushed on into the small intestine. Um, know that the stomach is a muscular organ. Um, so as food is in there, it actually churns and digests and stirs and mixes it. Know that it's folded up. It's got things called rugae that increase its surface area and allow it to stretch. Um, it's a pretty cool organ. Let's us eat. So after things are done in the stomach, the protein has been broken down a little bit. Chyme has been formed. We're going to take that chyme and push it on down into the small intestine. If we could go on to my next slide. There we go. Um, in the small intestine, you get a bunch of things going on. The bulk of our digestion actually happens in the small intestine. So if we're talking about breaking down, further breaking down proteins, breaking down fats, um, carbohydrates, all that stuff, the bulk of digestion happens in the small intestine. Now, one thing to know about the small intestine is that its surface is highly folded up into things called microvilli. So rather than being, you know, this smooth track that looks like this, the surface of it is folded up into all of these projections called microvilli. 
Now, the reason that this is the case is because it drastically increases the surface area, which is important because a lot of the absorption of nutrients happens in the small intestine. So by folding up the surface of the small intestine, you increase that surface area and you make the process of absorption much more efficient than if it were just a smooth tract like this. So note that in the small intestine, you've got the bulk of your digestion happening that's where the microvilli are, and that is where a lot of the absorption of nutrients happens. Following the small intestine, food makes it into the large intestine, also known as your colon. It is this piece right here that is wrapping around the outside of our small intestine. Biggest thing that happens in the large intestine is that water is reabsorbed and feces is formed. So that food moves from the small intestine into the colon. As it moves through the colon, it becomes solidified. There is some further breakdown of material, but for the most part, you're just forming feces and reabsorbing water before that food is eliminated from the body. So that is the digestive process. Let's go ahead and start looking at some adaptations that are needed to make eating happen in different species of animals. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of different adaptations that kind of make the form fit the function for certain diets. So first one, we've got a list of three skulls here, and this shows three different diets. So first one, you get your carnivores right here. Carnivores' mouths are built for tearing and shredding. So you get your large canines for catching prey, you've got a bunch of jagged premolars. Those are for grasping and tearing. And then in the back, you get a couple of flat molars, but they're still pretty sharp. So all the teeth in a carnivore are built for catching prey and tearing apart meat. Not much grinding or chewing going on, just kind of catching something and shredding it up so that you can eat it. Herbivores, on the other hand, you can see they've got some teeth out front. So this would be for grazing, pulling vegetation off things. And then in the back, all their molars are flat, built for grinding. So an herbivore is going to eat vegetation. Vegetation is full of cellulose and cell walls. So that vegetation needs to be ground up before it can be taken on down for digestion. And then you've got the omnivore, which has a combination. We've got a couple teeth in the front that look like those of the herbivore for pulling vegetation off of things. You've got a couple of canine teeth, like a carnivore, and then we've got molars in the back for grinding. So omnivores are a mix of the two. And just recognize that these are dental adaptations for different diets. Another adaptation that we see is in the shape of the digestive system. Sorry for the fuzzy picture. It was the best I could find. But the thing I really want to know out of this is if you compare the digestive tracts of a carnivore versus an herbivore, Herbivores have got a much longer digestive tract than a carnivore. Meat doesn't really take that much work to digest. The stomach hits it, breaks down some proteins, and then it goes down into the small intestine where it further breaks down, and then colon's pretty short. Um, so for carnivores, digestion is a pretty easy process. If you are an herbivore, though, that cellulose and the cell walls and plants takes a lot of work for your body to break down. So you can see that the digestive canal is greatly extended in an herbivore so that that food has a longer time in the system so that it can be worked on more by bacteria to break it down to extract the maximum amount of nutrition from that food before it's eliminated from the body. Final adaptation I want to talk about is mutualistic adaptations. We could not carry out the process of digestion without the bacteria that live in our guts. Um, our intestines are full of bacteria that help to break down food and produce vitamins. If we didn't have those things, we couldn't fully digest our food. And then there's other organisms like ruminants, like cows, that they are able to best break down plants because they have got these uh, bacteria in their guts that can break down the cellulose. Um, termites have it, ruminate, ruminants have it. Other than that, there aren't many organisms that actually can fully digest cellulose. For most animals, they eat cellulose and it passes through the tract and out the other end much as it went in. But because of those mutualistic adaptations, certain animals are able to break down cellulose that enters the body. All right, last slide for the day. Um, as far as regulation of eating in general goes, it's all on those feedback loops we talked about where you know some signal starts a process, then once that signal is met, it shuts down the process. Um, most of the feedback loops direct back to the brain and feeding centers in the brain, specifically the satiety center, and that's the center that basically says you're full, stop eating. Um, 
But there are all kinds of feedback loops that go on. There are some that regulate digestion in that some animals, they don't eat for a couple months. So their digestive systems don't really shut down, but they kind of go to sleep. When that organism eats some food, the eating of food triggers all of those mechanisms to turn on to secrete saliva, to start uh, peristalsis, which is the muscular movement of food that moves food down the esophagus. Digestive juices start running, things like that happen so that the animal is actually able to digest food. Um, we will talk about glucose in a later video, much more in depth, but just know that glucose and insulin help to regulate the amount of sugar that's in the blood, and that is all on a positive and negative feedback loop, mostly negative feedback loop, sorry. But that feedback loop ensures that there is not too much or too little sugar in our bloodstream. And then there are many uh, receptors, both chemical and physical, that regulate appetite. So there are some in the stomach that if the stomach is overstretched or when it hits a certain size, um, they essentially send a signal to the brain that says, hey, we're full, we're done, stop eating. Um, so just recognize that the regulation of appetite is a very complex thing. It functions mostly on feedback regulation, which we've talked about, but there are multiple moving parts in this thing that have to be regulated. So forgive me if that video was a bit long. I hope that it at least gave you some idea of how animal nutrition is different from one animal to the next and how it's regulated. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.